This is a reading of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Silmarillion. The Valaquenta, account of the Valar and Maiar, according to the lore of the Eldar. In the beginning, Eru, the One, who in the elvish tongue is named Ilavatar, made the Ainur of his thought, and they made a great music before him. In this music the world was begun. For Ilavatar made visible the song of the Ainur, and they beheld it as a light in the darkness. And many among them became enamored of its beauty and of its history, which they saw beginning and unfolding in, as in a vision. Therefore Ilavatar gave to their vision being, and set it amid the void, and the secret fire was sent to burn at the heart of the world, and it was called Ea. Then those of the Ainur who desired it arose and entered into the world at the beginning of time, and it was their task to achieve it, and by their labors to fulfill the vision which they had seen. Long they labored in the regions of Ea, which are vast beyond the thought of elves and men, until in the time appointed was made Arda the kingdom of earth. Then they put on the raiment of earth and ascended into it and dwelt therein. Of the Valar. The great among these spirits, the elves named the Valar, the powers of Arda, and men have often called them gods. The lords of the Valar are seven, and the Valier, the queens of the Valar, are seven also. These were their names in the elvish tongue, as it was spoken in Valinor, though they have other names in the speech of the elves in Middle earth, and their names among men are manifold. The names of the lords in due order are Manwe, Ulmo, Aule, Orome, Mandos, Lorien, and Tolkas. And the names of the queens are Varda, Yavana, Niena, Este, Varie, Nan, Vana, and Nessa. Melkor is counted no longer among the Valar, and his name is not spoken upon earth. Manwe and Melkor were brethren in the thought of Ilavatar. The mightiest of those Ainur who came into the world was in his beginning Melkor, but Manwe is dearest to Ilavatar and understands most clearly his purposes. He was appointed to be, in the fullness of time, the first of all kings, lord of the realm of Arda and ruler of all that dwell therein. In Arda his delight is in the winds and the clouds and in all the regions of the air from the heights to the depths, from the utmost borders of the Vale of Arda to the breezes that blow in the grass. Sulimo he is surnamed, Lord of the Breath of Arda. All swift birds, strong of wing, he loves, and they come and go at his bidding. Myth with Manwe dwells Varda, Lady of the Stars, who knows all the regions of Ea. Too great is her beauty to be declared in the words of men or elves. For the light of Ilavatar lives still in her face. In light is her power and her joy. Out of the deeps of Ea she came to the aid of Manwe. For Melkor she knew from before the making of the music and rejected him. And he hated her and feared her more than all others whom Eru made. Manwe and Varda are seldom parted and they remain in Valinor. Their halls are above the everlasting snow upon Oliose the uttermost tower of Tenequitil, tallest of all the mountains upon earth. When Manwe there ascends his throne and looks forth, if Varda is beside him, he sees further than all other eyes, through mist and through darkness, and over the leagues of the sea. And if Manwe is with her, Varda hears more clearly than all other ears the sound of voices that cry from east to west, from the hills and the valleys, and from the dark places that Melkor has made upon earth. Of all the great ones who dwell in this world, the elves hold Varda most in reverence and love. Elbereth they name her, and they call upon her name out of the shadows of Middle-earth, and uplift it in song at the rising of the stars. Olmo is the lord of waters. He is alone. He dwells nowhere long, but moves as he will, 
in all the deep waters about the earth or under the earth. He is next in might to Manwe, and before Valinor was made, he was the closest to him in friendship. But thereafter he went seldom to the councils of the Valar, unless great matters were in debate, for he kept all Arda in thought, and he has no need of any resting place. Moreover, he does not love to walk upon land, and will seldom clothe himself in a body after the manner of his peers. If the children of Eru beheld him, they were filled with a great dread. For the arising of the king of the sea was terrible, as a mountain wave that strides to the land, with dark helm foam-crested, and raiment of mail shimmering from silver down into shadows of green. The trumpets of Manwe are loud, but Olmo's voice is deep as the deeps of the ocean which he only has seen. Nonetheless, Olmo loves both elves and men, and never abandoned them, not even when they lay under the wrath of the Valar. At times he will come unseen to the shores of Middle-earth, or pass far inland up firths of the sea, and there make music upon his great horns, the Olumuri, that are wrought of white shell. And those to whom that music comes hear it ever after in their hearts, and longing for the sea never leaves them again. But mostly Olmo speaks to those who dwell in Middle-earth with voices that are heard only as the music of water. For all seas, lakes, rivers, fountains, and springs are in his government, so that the elves say that the spirit of Olmo runs in all the veins of the world. Thus news comes to Olmo, even in the deeps of all the needs and griefs of Arda, which otherwise would be hidden from Manwe. Aule has might little less than Olmo. His lordship is over all the substances of which Arda is made. In the beginning he wrought much in fellowship with Manwe and Olmo, and the fashioning of all lands was his labor. He is a smith and a master of all crafts, and he delights in works of skill, however small, as much as in the mighty building of old. His are the gems that lie deep in the earth, and the gold that is fair in the hand no less than the walls of the mountains, the basins of the sea. The Noldor learned most of him, and he was ever their friend. Melkor was jealous of him, for Aule was most like himself in thought and in powers, and there was long strife between them, in which Melkor ever marred or undid the works of Aule, and Aule grew weary in repairing the tumults and disorders of Melkor. Both also desired to make things of their own, that should be new and unthought of by others, and delighted in the praise of their skill. But Aule remained faithful to Eru, and submitted all that he did to his will. And he did not envy the works of others, but sought and gave counsel. Whereas Melkor spent his spirit in envy and hate, until at last he could make nothing save in mockery of the thought of the others, and all their works he destroyed if he could. The spouse of Aule is Yavanna, the giver of fruits. She is the lover of all things that grow in the earth, and all their countless forms she holds in her mind, from the trees like towers and forests long ago, to the moss upon stones or the small and secret things in the mold. In reverence Yavanna is next to Varda among the queens of the Valar. In the form of a woman she is tall and robed in green, but at times she takes other shapes. Some there are who have seen her standing like a tree under heaven, crowned with the sun. And from all its branches there spilled a golden dew upon the barren earth, and it grew green with corn. But the roots of the tree were in the waters of Olmo, and the winds of Manwe spoke in its leaves. Kementari, queen of the earth, she is surnamed in the Eldaran tongue. The Feantori, Masters of spirits are brethren, and they are called most often Mandos and Lorien, yet these are rightly the names of the places of their dwelling, and their true names are Nam Nemo and Irmo. Nemo, the elder, dwells in Mandos, which is westward in Valinor. He is the keeper of the houses of the dead, and the summoner of the spirits of the slain. He forgets nothing, 
and he knows all things that shall be, save only those that lie still in the freedom of Ilavatar. He is the doomsman of the Valar, but he pronounces his dooms and his judgments only at the bidding of Manwe. Vare, the weaver, is his spouse, who weaves all things that have ever been in time into her storied webs, and the halls of Mandos that ever widen as the ages pass are clothed with them. Irmo, the younger, is the master of visions and dreams. In Lorien are his gardens, and in the land of Val in, in the land of the Valar, and they are the fairest of all places in the world, filled with many spirits. Este, the gentle, healer of hurts and of weariness, is his spouse. Grey is her raiment, and rest is her gift. She walks not by day, but sleeps upon an island in the tree-shadowed lake of Lorelin. From the fountains of Irmo and Este, all those who dwell in Valinor draw refreshment, and often the Valar come themselves to Lorien, and there find repose and easing of the burden of Arda. Mightier than Este is Nienna, sister of the Fanturi. She dwells alone. She is acquainted with grief and mourns for every wound that Arda has suffered in the marring of Melkor. So great was her sorrow as the music unfolded that her song turned to lamentation long before its end, and the sound of mourning was woven into the themes of the world before it began. But she does not weep for herself, and those who hearken to her learn pity and endurance and hope. Her halls are west of west, upon the borders of the world, and she comes seldom to the city of Valimar, where all is glad. She goes rather to the halls of Mandos, which are near to her own, and all those who wait in Mandos cry to her, for she brings strength to the spirit and turns sorrow to wisdom. The windows of her house look outward from the walls of the world. Greatest in strength and deeds of prowess is Tolkas, who is surnamed Astaldo the Valiant. He came last to Arda to aid the Valar in the first battles with Melkor. He delights in wrestling and in contests of strength, and he rides no steed, for he can outrun all things that go on feet, and he is tireless. His hair and beard are golden, and his flesh ruddy. His weapons are his hands. He has little heed for either the past or the future, and is of no avail as a counselor, but is a hardy friend. His spouse is Nessa, the sister of Orome, and she also is lithe and fleet-footed. Deer she loves, and they follow her train whenever she goes in the wild, but she can outrun them, swift as an arrow, with the wind in her hair. In dancing she delights, and she dances in Valimar on lawns of never-fading green. Orome is a mighty lord. If he is less strong than Tolkas, he is more dreadful in anger, whereas Tolkas laughs ever, in sport or in war, and even in the face of Melkor he laughed in battles before the elves were born. Orome loved the lands of Middle-earth, and he left them unwillingly and came last to Valinor. And often of old he passed back east over the mountains and returned with his host to the hills and the plains. He is a hunter of monsters and fell beasts, and he delights in horses and in hounds, and all trees he loves, for which reason he is called Eldaron, and by the Sindar Toron, the lord of forests. Nahar is the name of his horse, white in the sun and shining silver at night. The Valaroma is the name of his great horn, the sound of which is like the upcoming of the sun in scarlet, or the sheer lightning cleaving the clouds. Above all the horns of his host, it was heard in the woods that Yavanna brought forth in Valinor. For there Orome would train his folk and his beasts for the pursuit of the evil creatures of Melkor. The spouse of Orome is Vanna, the ever young. She is the younger sister of Yavanna. All flowers spring as she passes and open if she glances upon them, and all birds sing at her coming.
These are the names of the Valar and the Valier, and here is told in brief their likenesses, such as the Eldar beheld them in Amman. But fair and noble as were the forms in which they were manifest to the children of Ilavatar, they were but a veil upon their beauty and their power. And if little is here said of all that the Eldar once knew, that is as nothing compared with their true being, which goes back into regions and ages far beyond our thought. Among them nine were of chief power and reverence, but one is removed from their number, and eight remain, the Aratar, the High Ones of Arda, Manwe and Varda, Olmo, Yavana and Aule, Mandos, Niena, and Orome. Though Manwe is their king and holds their allegiance under Eru, in majesty they are peers, surpassing beyond compare all others, whether of the Valar or the, and the Meyer, or any of other order that Ilavatar has sent into Ea. Of the Maiar, with the Valar came other spirits whose beings also began before the world, of the same order as the Valar, but of less degree. These are the Maiar, the people of the Valar, and their servants and helpers. Their number is not known to the elves, and few have names in any of the tongues of the children of Ilavatar. For though it is otherwise in Amman, in Middle-earth the Maiar have seldom appeared in form visible to elves and men. Chief among the Maiar of Valinor, whose names are remembered in the histories of the Elder Days, are Ilmare, the handmaid of Varda, and Aenwe, the banner-bearer and herald of Manwe, whose might in arms is surpassed by none in Arda. But of all the Maiar, Ose and Winan are best known to the children of Ilavator. Ose is a vassal of Ulmo, and he is master of the seas that wash the shores of Middle-earth. He does not go in the deeps, but loves the coasts and the isles, and rejoices in the winds of Manwe, for in storm he delights, and laughs amid the roaring of the waves. His spouse is Winan, the lady of the seas, whose hair lies spread through all waters under sky. All creatures she loves that live in the salt streams, and all weeds that grow there. To her mariners cry, for she can lay calm upon the waters of the waves, restraining the wildness of Ose. The Numenorians lived long in her protection, and held her in reverence equal to the Valar. Melkor hated the sea, for he could not subdue it. It is said that in the making of Arda he endeavored to draw Ose to his allegiance, promising to him all the realm and power of Olmo, if he would serve him. So it was that long ago there arose great tumults in the sea that wrought ruin to the lands, but Wainan, at the prayer of Ale, restrained Ose and brought him before Olmo, and he was pardoned and returned to his allegiance, to which he has remained faithful. For the most part, for the delight and violence has never wholly departed from him, and at times he will rage in his willfulness without any command from Olmo his lord. Therefore those who dwell by the sea, or go up in ships, may love him, but they do not trust him. Melian was the name of Amaya, who served both Vana and Este. She dwelt long in Lorien, tending the trees that flower in the gardens of Irmo, there she came to Middle-earth. Nightingales sang about her wherever she went. Wisest of the Maiar was Olorin. He too dwelt in Lorien, but his ways took him off into the houses of Nienna, and of her he learned pity and patience. Of Melian... Much is told in the Quenta Silmarillion, but of Olorin th that tale does not speak, for though he loved the elves, he walked among them unseen, or in form as one of them, and they did not know whence came the fair visions or the promptings of wisdom that he put into their hearts. In later days he was the friend of all the children of Ilavatar, and took pity on their sorrows. And those who listened to him awoke from despair, and put away the imaginations of darkness. Of the Enemies Last of all is set the name of Melkor. 
he who arises in might. But that name he has forfeited, and the Noldor, who among the elves suffered most from his malice, will not utter it, and they name him Morgoth, the dark enemy of the world. Great might was given to him by Ilivater, and he was coeval with Manwe. In, in the powers and knowledge of all the other Valar he had part, but he turned them to evil purposes, and squandered his strength in violence and tyranny. For he coveted Arda and all that was in it, desiring the kingship of Manwe and dominion over the realms of his peers. From splendor he fell, through arrogance, to contempt, for all things save himself, a spirit wasteful and pitiless. Understanding he turned to subtlety, and in perverting to his own will all that he would use, until he became a liar without shame. He began with the desire of light, but when he could not possess it for himself alone, he descended through fire and wrath into a great burning, down into darkness. And darkness he used most in his evil works upon Arda, and filled it with fear for all living things. Yet so great was the power of his uprising, that in ages forgotten he contended with Manwe, and all the Valar, and through long years in Arda held dominion over most of the lands of the earth. But he was not alone. For of the Maiar many were drawn to his splendor in the days of his greatness, and remained in that allegiance down into his darkness. And others he corrupted afterwards to his service, with lies and treacherous gifts. Dreadful among these spirits were the Valarakar, the scourges of fire that in Middle-earth were called the Balrogs, demons of terror. Among those of his servants that have names, the greatest was that spirit whom the Eldar called Sauron, or Galth. Gorthar the cruel. In his beginning he was the mire he was of the mire of Aule, and he remained mighty in the lore of that people. In all the deeds of Melkor the Morgoth upon Arda, in his vast works and in the deceits of his cunning, Sauron had a part, and was only less evil than his master, in that for long he served another and not himself. But in after years he rose like a shadow of Morgoth, and a ghost of his malice, and walked behind him on the same ruinous path down into the void. Here ends the Valaquenta. Please purchase your own copy of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Silmarillion. This is a reading.